Early Life and Career Andrew Johnson, born on December 29, 1808, in Raleigh, North Carolina, to Jacob Johnson, 1778-1812, and Mary, Polly, McDonough, 1783-1856, a laundress, spent his early years in a humble two-room shack that later became a symbolic cornerstone in his political narrative. During the mid-19th century, Johnson, with English, Scots-Irish, and Irish roots, had a brother, William, for years his senior, and an older sister, Elizabeth, who tragically passed away during childhood. Andrew's father, Jacob Johnson, reflected the cycle of modest means, much like his own father, William Johnson. Despite their humble beginnings, Jacob managed to become the town constable of Raleigh after working as a porter for the State Bank of North Carolina, appointed by William Polk, a relative of President James K. Polk. Illiterate tavern servants, both Jacob and Mary, Andrew's parents struggled to provide formal education for their son, leading him to grow up in poverty. Tragedy struck early when Jacob succumbed to an apparent heart attack while ringing the town bell when Andrew was merely three years old. Andrew's mother, Polly Johnson, a washerwoman, bravely stepped into the role of the sole provider for her family. Despite societal disdain for her occupation, she persevered. Remarriage to Turner Doe Try, a man as destitute as she was, marked a chapter of resilience in Polly's life. The contours of Andrew Johnson's childhood took a distinctive turn when his older brother, William, was apprenticed to a tailor named James Selby. Following suit, Andrew, at the age of 10, entered into a binding apprenticeship with Selby, during which he lived with his mother. Basic literacy skills were imparted by one of Selby's employees, and Johnson's passion for learning blossomed through communal readings in the tailor shop. These formative experiences would later contribute to Johnson's prowess as a skilled public speaker. However, Johnson's discontent at Selby's shop became evident, prompting both him and his brother to run away after approximately five years. The Runaway Act led to a reward being offered for their return. Seeking refuge in Carthage, North Carolina, Johnson worked as a tailor before relocating to Lawrence, South Carolina, where he found employment, encountered his first love, Mary Wood, and crafted a quilt for her. Unfortunately, his proposal was met with rejection. Upon returning to Raleigh with aspirations to buy out his apprenticeship, negotiations with Selby faltered. Faced with the risk of apprehension for abandoning Selby, Johnson made the pivotal decision to move west. Embarking on a predominantly foot-driven odyssey, Andrew Johnson bid farewell to North Carolina, venturing towards Tennessee. A brief interlude in Knoxville preceded his relocation to Mooresville, Alabama. In Columbia, Tennessee, Johnson found employment as a tailor. However, familial beckoning summoned him back to Raleigh, where limited prospects prompted the decision to move west. Crossing the Blue Ridge Mountains, the entourage, including Johnson, arrived in the enchanting town of Greenville, Tennessee. The allure was so compelling that Johnson, upon achieving prosperity, acquired the land where he initially camped, commemorating the spot with the planting of a tree. Greenville became the canvas for Johnson's triumphs. Establishing a flourishing tailoring business within his home, he married Eliza McCardle at the age of 18 in 1827. Eliza, the 16-year-old daughter of a local shoemaker, and Johnson formed a union lasting almost five decades. The couple navigated life together, blessed with five children, Martha, 1828, Charles, 1830, Mary, 1832, Robert, 1834, and Andrew Jr., 1852. Eliza, despite battling tuberculosis, played a pivotal role in Johnson's life, imparting mathematical knowledge and honing his writing skills. She remained a discreet presence during Johnson's political ascendancy, with their daughter Martha assuming the role of the official hostess during his presidency. Prosperity smiled upon Johnson's tailoring enterprise in the initial years of their marriage, enabling him to employ assistants and make astute real estate investments. Proud of his craft, Johnson boldly declared, my work never ripped or gave way. His avid reading habits, especially books on renowned orators, fueled his interest in political discourse. Engaging in private debates with customers holding opposing views, and participating in debates at Greenville College marked his intellectual pursuits. The specter of slavery entered Johnson's narrative as he acquired his first slave, Dolly, in 1843. Dolly, aged 14, bore three children, Liz, Florence, and William. Subsequently, 
Johnson added Dolly's half-brother, Sam, to his roster, who would later become a commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. In a unique turn of events, Sam, negotiating his work terms, eventually received a tract of land from Andrew Johnson for free in 1867. In 1857, Johnson expanded his ownership, acquiring Henry, a 13-year-old, who later accompanied the family to the White House. Johnson's slaveholding portfolio tallied at least 10 individuals. A pivotal moment unfolded on August 8, 1863, when Andrew Johnson emancipated his slaves, ushering them into the realm of paid servants. A year later, as the military governor of Tennessee, he proclaimed the freedom of the state's slaves. Former slave Sam and Margaret, residing in Johnson's tailor shop during his presidency without rent, expressed gratitude by presenting him with a watch inscribed with for his untiring energy in the cause of freedom. Political Rise In the 1829 municipal election in Greenville, Andrew Johnson assumed a pivotal role, spearheading the organization of a mechanics, working men's, ticket. Securing his position as town alderman alongside comrades Blackston McDaniel and Mordecai Lincoln, Johnson embarked on the commencement of his political odyssey. The aftermath of the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in 1831 prompted a state convention to draft a new constitution, featuring provisions to disenfranchise free people of color. The convention's broader goals included reforming real estate tax rates and devising means to enhance Tennessee's infrastructure. Johnson actively championed the Constitution's adoption, contributing to a triumphant campaign that propelled him to statewide recognition. On January 4, 1834, his fellow alderman elected him mayor of Greenville. In 1835, Johnson set his sights on the floater, open, seat shared by Greene County and neighboring Washington County in the Tennessee House of Representatives. Renowned for demolishing opposition in debates, Johnson secured victory with a substantial two-to-one margin, as described by his biographer Hans L. Trefus. During his Greenville tenure, Johnson, attaining the rank of colonel in the Tennessee militia, faced fines for an undisclosed offense during his enrollment. Henceforth, he carried the title of colonel. In the legislative sphere, Johnson's allegiance did not consistently align with either the Democratic or the nascent Whig Party during his initial term held in Nashville. Despite his admiration for President Andrew Jackson, a fellow Tennessean and Democrat, the party system was in flux, and Johnson's votes mirrored this uncertainty. The emergence of the Whig Party in opposition to Jackson prompted Johnson's opposition to substantial government spending, and voiced objections to aid for railroads. After succumbing to Brookings Campbell and the Whigs in the 1837 re-election, Johnson remained unbeaten for the next three decades. In 1839, aiming to reclaim his seat. He initially ran as a Whig but switched to the Democratic Party when another candidate pursued the Whig nomination. His electoral triumph solidified his allegiance to the Democratic Party, and he went on to construct a formidable political machine in Greene County. Known for his eloquence, Johnson became a prominent advocate for the Democratic Party in an era when public speaking served both informative and entertaining purposes, drawing sizable crowds. In 1840, Johnson assumed the role of a presidential elector for Tennessee, amplifying his statewide visibility. Despite Democratic President Martin Van Buren's defeat by William Henry Harrison, Johnson played a crucial role in maintaining Greene County's Democratic affiliation. His election to the Tennessee Senate in 1841 marked a two-year term of service. Despite achieving financial success in his tailoring business, Johnson divested from it to concentrate on his burgeoning political career. His real estate holdings expanded, encompassing a larger residence, a farm housing his mother and stepfather, and ownership of eight or nine slaves. Having traversed both chambers of the state legislature, Andrew Johnson set his sights on a congressional seat, deeming it the logical progression in his political trajectory. Employing strategic political maneuvers, including displacing the Whig postmaster in Greenville, he skillfully garnered Democratic support. In the ensuing election, Johnson triumphed over Jonesboro lawyer John A. Aiken with a vote count of 5,495 to 4,892. As a member of the new Democratic majority in the House of Representatives in Washington, Johnson ardently championed the interests of the impoverished, maintained an anti-abolitionist stance, advocated for limited government spending, and opposed protective tariffs. 
With his wife Eliza remaining in Greenville, Congressman Johnson eschewed social functions, dedicating his time to scholarly pursuits in the Library of Congress. Despite having campaigned for Democrat James K. Polk, who assumed the presidency in 1844, Johnson's relations with Polk were strained as the president declined some of Johnson's patronage suggestions. Aligned with many Southern Democrats, Johnson believed in the Constitution's protection of private property, including slaves. He secured a second term in 1845 against William G. Brownlow, positioning himself as the defender of the poor against the aristocracy. During this term, Johnson supported the Polk administration's decision to engage in the Mexican War and opposed the Wilmot Proviso, which sought to prohibit slavery in territories acquired from Mexico. He also introduced his homestead bill for the first time, aiming to grant 160 acres to settlers willing to cultivate the land and gain title to it, a cause resonating with Johnson's humble beginnings. In the 1848 presidential election, Democratic divisions over the slavery issue led to the emergence of the Free Soil Party by abolitionists. Johnson supported Democratic candidate Lewis Cass, while Whig nominee General Zachary Taylor emerged victorious, with Tennessee in his favor. Johnson's strained relations with President Polk persisted, with Polk openly expressing displeasure at Johnson's opposition. Focusing on slavery, homesteads, and judicial elections in his fourth-term campaign, Johnson defeated opponent Nathaniel G. Taylor in August 1849, with a larger margin of victory than in previous campaigns. His proposal to allow the election of a speaker by a plurality gained traction, resulting in the election of Democrat Howell Cobb as speaker. As Congress delved into legislative matters, the contentious issue of slavery took center stage. Johnson endorsed most provisions of the Compromise of 1850, introduced by Kentucky's Henry Clay aiming to admit California as a free state and address various concerns from both sides. While supporting constitutional amendments for the popular election of senators and the president, and limiting federal judges' tenure to 12 years, these proposals faced defeat. Encountering opposition in his bid for a fifth term, Johnson defeated Democrat Landon Carter Haynes in the general election, with the Whigs abstaining from nominating a candidate. The campaign focused on Johnson's main issue, the Homestead Bill, and he emerged victorious by over 1,600 votes. In the 1852 presidential election, Johnson campaigned for Democrat Franklin Pierce, who won, though Tennessee did not vote in his favor. In 1852, Johnson successfully guided his Homestead Bill through the House, but it faltered in the Senate. With the Whigs now controlling the Tennessee legislature, they reshaped Johnson's district boundaries to favor their party, marking what they perceived as the conclusion of Johnson's political future. Johnson, in lamentation, conceded, I have no political future. Despite initial contemplations of retiring from the political arena, Andrew Johnson had a change of heart and embraced the Democratic nomination for governor of Tennessee. Despite some discontent among party members, the Democratic Convention unanimously selected him. The Whigs, victorious in the two prior gubernatorial elections and still in control of the legislature, nominated Gustavus Henry, immediately raising concerns with the redrawing of the first district boundaries known as Henry Mandering. Engaging in debates across Tennessee, Johnson and Henry suspended them due to illness in Henry's family two weeks before the August 1853 election. Johnson secured victory with 63,413 votes to 61,163, obtaining some votes by pledging support for Whig Nathaniel Taylor's former seat in Congress. The governorship bestowed limited power upon Johnson, allowing him to propose legislation but lacking the authority to veto, with most appointments falling under the purview of the Whig-controlled legislature. Nonetheless, the position served as a platform for Johnson to promote himself and his political perspectives. During his term, Johnson brokered desired appointments by endorsing Whig John Bell for one of the state's U.S. Senate seats. Advocating for the simplification of the state judicial system, abolition of the Bank of Tennessee, and the establishment of an agency for uniformity in weights and measures, Johnson saw success with the enactment of the latter proposal. Criticizing the state's common school system, he proposed increased funding through taxes, leading to several reforms during his tenure, including the establishment of the state's public library and its inaugural public school system. 
Despite the national decline of the Whig Party, it remained formidable in Tennessee, presenting a challenging re-election scenario for Democrats in 1855. Recognizing the significance of securing a second term as governor for future political prospects, Johnson opted to run again. Mayor Dith P. Gentry was the Whig nominee, and the campaign centered on issues such as slavery, alcohol prohibition, and the nativist positions of the Know Nothing Party. Johnson emerged victorious, albeit with a narrower margin than in 1853. Approaching the 1856 presidential election, Johnson aspired to the Democratic nomination, positioning himself as a favorite son in some Tennessee county conventions. While not a leading contender, he actively campaigned for the Democratic ticket of James Buchanan and John C. O. Breckinridge, who ultimately secured victory. Choosing not to pursue a third term as governor, Johnson redirected his ambitions toward the U.S. Senate. In 1857, during his return from Washington, a derailment of his train resulted in significant damage to his right arm, an injury that would continue to afflict him in the years to come. Following his gubernatorial term in 1857, Andrew Johnson set his sights on a seat in the United States Senate. Despite fervent opposition from the Whigs, who sought to thwart his election, the Democrats emerged victorious in the legislative campaign, securing control of the legislature. Despite significant resistance from the Whigs and know-nothings, Johnson's appeal to small farmers and self-employed tradesmen, whom he affectionately referred to as plebeians, resulted in his senatorial triumph. His parting address as governor allowed him to sway electors, ultimately leading the legislature to choose him for the Senate. Upon assuming his Senate seat in December 1857, Johnson promptly shifted his focus to championing the Homestead Bill. However, suspicions surrounding the slavery issue presented challenges. Southern senators, fearing that the bill favored northern non-slaveholders, opposed its passage. Despite being a slaveholder from a southern state, Johnson delivered a compelling speech, aiming to persuade his colleagues that the Homestead Bill and slavery were not mutually exclusive. Despite his efforts, the bill suffered defeat in 1858 and encountered further setbacks in 1859 and 1860. Although the legislation finally secured passage in 1860, it faced a presidential veto from President Buchanan, yielding to pressure from Southern lawmakers. In tandem with his advocacy for the Homestead Bill, Johnson steadfastly opposed extravagant government spending. Chairing a committee focused on fiscal restraint, he argued against allocating funds for Washington, D.C. S. infrastructure, asserting that the cost of the city streets should not burden state citizens. Additionally, Johnson resisted funding troops to quell the Mormon revolt in Utah Territory, advocating for temporary volunteers instead of maintaining a standing army. During his Senate tenure, Johnson grappled with the escalating sectional tensions over slavery. His persistent efforts to advance the Homestead Bill underscored his commitment to policies benefiting small farmers and settlers. In October 1859, the Harpers Ferry Raid orchestrated by abolitionist John Brown heightened the already strained relations between pro- and anti-slavery factions in Washington. Johnson, a prosperous individual who possessed 14 slaves at the time, delivered a pivotal speech in the Senate in December, censuring Northerners advocating for the abolition of slavery. He asserted that the phrase all men are created equal, from the Declaration of Independence did not extend to African Americans. Amid the escalating debate over slavery, Johnson aspired to be a compromise candidate for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination during the 1860 Democratic National Convention in Charleston. The convention reached an impasse, resulting in a schism within the party. Northerners rallied behind Stephen Douglas, while Southerners, including Johnson, supported Vice President Breckinridge. The election of Abraham Lincoln as the first Republican president triggered discussions of secession in the southern states. Following Lincoln's election, Johnson, despite his southern roots, took a firm stance against secession. In a Senate floor address, he reaffirmed his dedication to the Union and called on patriots to unite around the Constitution. As Southern senators declared their intention to resign if their state seceded, Johnson implored them to remain in the Senate, where Democrats could potentially maintain control and safeguard Southern interests. Upon returning to Tennessee during the secession deliberations, Johnson encountered threats on his life and physical assaults. Despite these challenges, 
he actively campaigned against the proposal for a constitutional convention authorizing secession and the prospect of leaving the Union. In his impassioned speeches, he even used a gun on the lectern. Despite the opposition in his region, the second referendum passed, leading to Tennessee joining the Confederacy in June 1861. Fearing for his life, Johnson fled through the Cumberland Gap, facing gunfire along the way. He left his wife and family in Greenville. As the sole representative from a seceded state to remain in the Senate, Johnson emerged as a prominent Southern Unionist, capturing President Lincoln's attention in the early months of the Civil War. With most of Tennessee under Confederate control, Johnson spent congressional recesses in Kentucky and Ohio, attempting, albeit unsuccessfully, to persuade Union commanders to undertake operations in East Tennessee. In March 1862, Abraham Lincoln appointed Andrew Johnson as the military governor of Tennessee, signaling the conclusion of his initial Senate tenure. By this time, substantial portions of the central and western regions of the state had been reclaimed from Confederate control. While some advocated for the immediate restoration of civil government in areas liberated from Confederate rule, Lincoln, in his capacity as commander-in-chief, chose to appoint military governors over Union-controlled southern territories. Johnson's designation as military governor, coupled with the rank of brigadier general, swiftly received confirmation from the Senate. In response, the Confederates confiscated his land and slaves, repurposing his residence into a military hospital. During Johnson's absence from the Senate in 1862, the long-pending Homestead Bill, alongside legislation for land-grant colleges and the Transcontinental Railroad, was finally enacted. These legislative actions contributed to the opening of the Western United States for settlement. In his role as military governor, Johnson concentrated on eradicating rebel influence within the state. He mandated loyalty oaths from public officials and shut down newspapers owned by Confederate sympathizers. Despite facing challenges, such as the continued Confederate control of much of eastern Tennessee, Johnson's administration worked to safeguard Nashville from Confederate threats. His family, permitted by the Confederates, joined him during this period. Despite constant harassment from Confederate cavalry raids led by General Nathan Bedford Forrest, Johnson successfully defended Nashville. Union relief arrived with General William S. Rosecrans' victory over the Confederates at Murfreesboro in early 1863. Later that year, Union forces captured a significant portion of eastern Tennessee. In January 1863, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring freedom for all slaves in Confederate-held areas, he exempted Tennessee at Johnson's request. This decision fueled debates over the fate of slaves after the war, as not all Unionists supported abolition. Despite initial hesitation, Johnson eventually concluded that slavery had to end. He actively supported initiatives to enlist former slaves into the Union Army, recognizing their potential to perform essential tasks and thereby freeing white Americans for combat. Despite his initial reservations, Johnson succeeded in recruiting 20,000 black soldiers to serve the Union cause. Vice Presidency, 1865 in 1860, Abraham Lincoln's running mate was Senator Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. Despite Hamlin's competence, good health, and willingness to seek re-election, Andrew Johnson emerged as Lincoln's running mate for the 1864 re-election bid. Lincoln explored various war Democrats as potential running mates in 1864, sending an agent to consider General Benjamin Butler. General Daniel Sickles was dispatched to Nashville on a fact-finding mission in May 1864 with some speculating its connection to Johnson's subsequent nomination for vice president. Impressed by Johnson's administration of Tennessee, Lincoln viewed him as a unifying figure, and including a Southern War Democrat like Johnson sent a strong message against secession. To underscore unity, Lincoln ran under the banner of the National Union Party in 1864. At the party's convention in Baltimore, Johnson was nominated for vice president. He actively campaigned in several states, delivering speeches and garnering support. Lincoln and Johnson easily won the election, securing victories in most states that voted. Although Congress initially hesitated to count Tennessee's electoral votes, it did not affect their overall victory. Vice President-elect Johnson was eager to complete the work of re-establishing civilian government in Tennessee, 
but was advised to travel to Washington and be sworn in with Lincoln. Johnson faced challenges during the inauguration, appearing hungover and delivering a rambling address. Following the ceremony, he briefly presided over the Senate and then avoided public scrutiny. Johnson's behavior drew criticism, but Lincoln, understanding Johnson's character, defended him, stating that, and he ain't a drunkard. After the inauguration, Johnson contemplated returning to Tennessee, but the capture of Richmond by General Ulysses S. Grant signaled the approaching end of the Civil War. Lincoln reassured others about Johnson, emphasizing that he wasn't a drunkard despite the incident at the inauguration. Presidency, 1865-1869 On the afternoon of April 14, 1865, Andrew Johnson and Abraham Lincoln met for the first time since the inauguration. Johnson wanted to discuss with Lincoln the issue of leniency toward traitors, a sentiment shared by many who were not in favor of a forgiving approach to the Confederacy. Later that night, President Lincoln was assassinated at Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth, a Confederate sympathizer. The assassination was part of a larger conspiracy that also targeted Johnson and Secretary of State William H. Seward. Seward survived a knife attack, while Johnson narrowly escaped harm as his would-be assassin, George Atzerodt, failed to carry out the plan. Johnson was informed of Lincoln's shooting by Leonard Jade Farwell, a fellow boarder at the Kirkwood House. He rushed to Lincoln's deathbed and, upon his return, vowed that those responsible for the assassination would suffer consequences. The next morning, April 15, 1865, Johnson was sworn in as the 17th President of the United States in a solemn ceremony presided over by Chief Justice Salmon, P. Chase. Conspiracy theories have speculated about the conspirators' intentions regarding Johnson, but there is no conclusive evidence suggesting that he was a primary target. Despite Booth leaving a card at the Kirkwood House with a message for Johnson on the day of the assassination, there is no indication that Johnson was a central figure in the conspirators' plans. In the aftermath of Lincoln's death, Johnson took on the responsibility of overseeing the funeral ceremonies in Washington. He assumed the presidency during a tumultuous time marked by the end of the Civil War and the challenges of Reconstruction. Johnson faced criticism for his handling of Reconstruction policies and for being perceived as too lenient towards the South. One significant decision was placing a bounty on Confederate President Jefferson Davis, who was a fugitive at the time. Additionally, Johnson allowed the execution of Mary Surratt, one of the conspirators involved in Lincoln's assassination. Surratt was executed along with three others on July 7, 1865. Johnson's presidency was marked by the complex and contentious process of Reconstruction, as the nation sought to heal and rebuild after the Civil War. Upon assuming office, President Andrew Johnson faced the challenging question of how to handle the former Confederacy during the Reconstruction period. While President Lincoln had advocated a lenient 10% plan, requiring only 10% of voters in a state to take an oath of future loyalty to the Union for elections to proceed. Congress deemed this approach too forgiving. In 1864, Congress proposed its own plan, which required a majority of voters to take a loyalty oath, but Lincoln pocket vetoed it. Johnson had three primary goals in Reconstruction. Firstly, he aimed for a swift restoration of the Southern states, arguing that they had never truly left the Union. Secondly, he sought a shift in political power from the planter class to what he referred to as the plebeians. Lastly, Johnson was focused on his own re-election in 1868, aspiring to secure a democratic anti-congressional reconstruction coalition in the South. The Republicans were divided into factions during this period. Radical Republicans advocated for civil rights for African Americans, believing that the freedmen could be encouraged to vote Republican. Moderate Republicans aimed to keep Democrats out of power and were not as enthusiastic about African-American suffrage. Northern Democrats supported the unconditional restoration of Southern states and were against African-American suffrage. Initially, Congress was not in session, leaving Johnson to devise a reconstruction policy without legislative intervention. His initial proclamations, issued on May 29, recognized loyalist governments in Virginia and North Carolina and provided amnesty for ex-rebels, excluding those with significant property holdings. These proclamations did not address black suffrage or the rights of freedmen. 
Johnson's policies received support in the North, but he underestimated Northern determination to ensure that the war had not been fought in vain. Northern public opinion insisted on Southern acknowledgement of defeat, the end of slavery, and improved conditions for African Americans. As Southern states formed governments, Johnson's lenient approach faced opposition. Congress reconvened in December 1865, and Johnson's conciliatory approach was met with resistance. Despite his initial support from moderates, Johnson's veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and his opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1866 led to a break with the Republicans. Johnson believed that confronting the radical Republicans was necessary for the success of Reconstruction and his re-election in 1868. The conflict escalated in 1866, with Johnson delivering provocative speeches and vetoing legislation aimed at protecting the rights of freedmen. The rift between Johnson and Congress widened, culminating in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 over his veto. Congress also proposed the 14th Amendment, extending citizenship to all persons born in the U.S., penalizing states that denied suffrage to freedmen and creating federal civil rights. Efforts to compromise failed, and a political war ensued between Republicans and Johnson, who formed the National Union Party. The 1866 elections were a landslide victory for Republicans, strengthening their control over Reconstruction. Johnson's attempts to unite his supporters through the Swing Around the Circle campaign proved disastrous. The Democrats' lukewarm support and Johnson's confrontations with hecklers led to a significant Republican victory. The stage was set for a continued struggle between the President and Congress over Reconstruction policies. Radical Reconstruction marked a tumultuous period in American history, characterized by political strife and impeachment proceedings against President Andrew Johnson. Despite the Republican victory in the November 1866 elections, Johnson remained confident in his position, particularly as the 14th Amendment faced challenges in its ratification. By early 1867, Congress, now energized, began passing legislation over presidential vetoes. This included the District of Columbia Voting Bill and the admission of Nebraska to the Union, which gained two senators for the Republicans and a state that ratified the 14th Amendment. Johnson's veto of a bill for the statehood of Colorado Territory was sustained. In January 1867, radical Republican Thaddeus Stevens introduced legislation to dissolve southern state governments and subject them to military rule under martial law. The states would then reform through constitutional conventions, with African Americans eligible to vote or become delegates, while former Confederates were excluded. Congress amended the bill to tie restoration to the Union to a state's ratification of the 14th Amendment. Johnson attempted a compromise, proposing a modified version of the amendment without disqualifying former Confederates and allowing limited black suffrage. However, the Republicans insisted on the full language of the amendment, leading to a failed compromise. On March 2, 1867, Johnson vetoed the first Reconstruction Act, but Congress overruled him the same day. In response to Johnson's statements during his Swing Around the Circle tour that he intended to dismiss cabinet members who disagreed with him, Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act on March 2, 1867. This act required Senate approval for cabinet member dismissals during the president's tenure and one month thereafter. Johnson's veto was overridden, leading to a contentious relationship between the executive and legislative branches. The impeachment proceedings against Johnson gained momentum. In March 1867, the House Committee on the Judiciary conducted the first impeachment inquiry, which did not result in charges. However, as tensions escalated, Congress passed the first Reconstruction Act and the Tenure of Office Act in March 1867. Impeachment efforts intensified in 1868, focusing on Johnson's removal of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. The Senate disapproved of Johnson's suspension of Stanton and his appointment of Lorenzo Thomas as a replacement, arguing that he had violated the Tenure of Office Act. Johnson's refusal to comply led to his impeachment by the House on February 24, 1868. Johnson's presidency was marked by the complex and contentious process of Reconstruction, as the nation sought to heal and rebuild after the Civil War. Upon assuming office, President Andrew Johnson faced the challenging question of how to handle the former Confederacy during the Reconstruction period. 
while President Lincoln had advocated a lenient 10% plan, requiring only 10% of voters in a state to take an oath of future loyalty to the Union for elections to proceed. Congress deemed this approach too forgiving. In 1864, Congress proposed its own plan, which required a majority of voters to take a loyalty oath, but Lincoln pocket vetoed it. Johnson had three primary goals in Reconstruction. Firstly, he aimed for a swift restoration of the Southern states, arguing that they had never truly left the Union. Secondly, he sought a shift in political power from the planter class to what he referred to as the plebeians. Lastly, Johnson was focused on his own re-election in 1868, aspiring to secure a democratic anti-congressional reconstruction coalition in the South. The Republicans were divided into factions during this period. Radical Republicans advocated for civil rights for African Americans, believing that the freedmen could be encouraged to vote Republican. Moderate Republicans aimed to keep Democrats out of power and were not as enthusiastic about African American suffrage. Northern Democrats supported the unconditional restoration of Southern states and were against African American suffrage. Initially, Congress was not in session, leaving Johnson to devise a reconstruction policy without legislative intervention. His initial proclamations, issued on May 29, recognized loyalist governments in Virginia and North Carolina and provided amnesty for ex-rebels, excluding those with significant property holdings. These proclamations did not address black suffrage or the rights of freedmen. Johnson's policies received support in the North, but he underestimated Northern determination to ensure that the war had not been fought in vain. Northern public opinion insisted on Southern acknowledgement of defeat, the end of slavery, and improved conditions for African Americans. As Southern states formed governments, Johnson's lenient approach faced opposition. Congress reconvened in December 1865, and Johnson's conciliatory approach was met with resistance. Despite his initial support from moderates, Johnson's veto of the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and his opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1866 led to a break with the Republicans. Johnson believed that confronting the radical Republicans was necessary for the success of Reconstruction and his re-election in 1868. The conflict escalated in 1866, with Johnson delivering provocative speeches and vetoing legislation aimed at protecting the rights of freedmen. The rift between Johnson and Congress widened, culminating in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 over his veto. Congress also proposed the 14th Amendment, extending citizenship to all persons born in the U.S., penalizing states that denied suffrage to freedmen and creating federal civil rights. Efforts to compromise failed, and a political war ensued between Republicans and Johnson, who formed the National Union Party. The 1866 elections were a landslide victory for Republicans, strengthening their control over Reconstruction. Johnson's attempts to unite his supporters through the Swing Around the Circle campaign proved disastrous. The Democrats' lukewarm support and Johnson's confrontations with hecklers led to a significant Republican victory. The stage was set for a continued struggle between the President and Congress over Reconstruction policies. Radical Reconstruction marked a tumultuous period in American history, characterized by political strife and impeachment proceedings against President Andrew Johnson. Despite the Republican victory in the November 1866 elections, Johnson remained confident in his position, particularly as the 14th Amendment faced challenges in its ratification. By early 1867, Congress, now energized, began passing legislation over presidential vetoes. This included the District of Columbia Voting Bill and the admission of Nebraska to the Union, which gained two senators for the Republicans and a state that ratified the 14th Amendment. Johnson's veto of a bill for the statehood of Colorado Territory was sustained. In January 1867, radical Republican Thaddeus Stevens introduced legislation to dissolve southern state governments and subject them to military rule under martial law. The states would then reform through constitutional conventions with African Americans eligible to vote or become delegates, while former Confederates were excluded. Congress amended the bill to tie restoration to the Union to a state's ratification of the 14th Amendment. Johnson attempted a compromise, proposing a modified version of the amendment without disqualifying former Confederates and allowing limited black suffrage. However, the Republicans insisted on the full language of the amendment, 
leading to a failed compromise. On March 2, 1867, Johnson vetoed the first Reconstruction Act, but Congress overruled him the same day. In response to Johnson's statements during his Swing Around the Circle tour that he intended to dismiss cabinet members who disagreed with him, Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act on March 2, 1867. This act required Senate approval for cabinet member dismissals during the president's tenure and one month thereafter. Johnson's veto was overridden, leading to a contentious relationship between the executive and legislative branches. The impeachment proceedings against Johnson gained momentum. In March 1867, the House Committee on the Judiciary conducted the first impeachment inquiry, which did not result in charges. However, as tensions escalated, Congress passed the first Reconstruction Act and the Tenure of Office Act in March 1867. Impeachment efforts intensified in 1868, focusing on Johnson's removal of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. The Senate disapproved of Johnson's suspension of Stanton and his appointment of Lorenzo Thomas as a replacement, arguing that he had violated the Tenure of Office Act. Johnson's refusal to comply led to his impeachment by the House on February 24, 1868. In 1872, Johnson entered the arena as an independent candidate in a special election for an at-large congressional seat in Tennessee. Despite finishing third, his candidacy splintered the Democratic Party, leading to the defeat of the Democratic nominee, Benjamin F. Cheatham. In 1873, Johnson battled cholera during an epidemic but managed to recover. Financial setbacks ensued when the First National Bank of Washington collapsed resulting in a loss of approximately $73,000, equivalent to about $1.63 million in 2022. Nevertheless, a substantial portion of the sum was eventually repaid. Undeterred by challenges, Johnson set his sights on a political resurgence, eyeing the early 1875 Senate election. Aligning himself with the Farmers Grange movement and leveraging his Jeffersonian inclinations, he secured their support. Despite resistance from radical Republicans, he embarked on a statewide campaign, addressing audiences throughout Tennessee. The decline of Reconstruction in the state was evident, with few African Americans able to participate in the electoral process. In the August 1874 legislative elections, Democrats secured a significant majority, prompting Johnson to journey to Nashville for the legislative session. Commencing on January 20, 1875, the balloting for the Senate seat initially eluded Johnson of the required majority. After multiple ballots, he secured victory on January 26 by a single vote margin. Johnson's political resurgence captured national attention as he returned to the Senate. On March 5, 1875, he was sworn in amidst floral greetings, sharing the occasion with his predecessor as Vice President Hannibal Hamlin and incumbent Vice President Henry Wilson. Johnson's return to the Senate marked a singular moment in American history, making him the sole former president to serve in the Senate. However, Johnson's reentry into public life was brief. Following the conclusion of the special session, he opted to travel to Ohio for speeches. Unfortunately, during the journey, he suffered a stroke on the evening of July 28, 1875, at his daughter Mary's farm near Elizabeth Tun. Despite initially declining medical intervention, he eventually succumbed to another stroke on July 30, passing away early the next morning at the age of 66. President Grant announced his death, and Johnson was interred with honors in Greenville. His funeral transpired on August 3, 1875, and he found his final resting place in the Andrew Johnson National Cemetery, established in 1906 as part of the Andrew Johnson National Historic Site. Historical Reputation and Legacy Historian Castell contends that assessments of Andrew Johnson's presidency, particularly in the context of Reconstruction, have undergone intense scrutiny. In the late 19th century, evaluations of Johnson were sparse, and Northern memoirs depicted him as obstinate, leaning favorably towards the South during the tumultuous period of Reconstruction. As the 20th century commenced, the first substantial historical evaluation surfaced. James Ford Rhodes critiqued Johnson for employing intellectual force in a resolute yet stubborn manner, attributing postbellum Southern issues to him. 
Others concurred with this perspective, characterizing Johnson as flawed but endeavoring to execute Lincoln's Southern plans. However, a historiographical shift unfolded in the 1920s, marked by pro-Johnson literature extolling his virtues while denouncing his adversaries. Johnson was portrayed as a compassionate and liberal statesman, championing the Constitution against radical Republicans. This shift marked a substantial rehabilitation of Johnson's historical image. By the 1940s, skepticism emerged regarding the prevailing viewpoint, with historians questioning the notion that Reconstruction-era figures were inherently malevolent. Despite evolving perspectives, Johnson's favorable image endured for a period. The 1950s witnessed a shift in focus, with historians delving into the African-American experience during Reconstruction, resulting in a more critical assessment of Johnson's actions, particularly concerning the rights of newly emancipated individuals. In the early 21st century, Johnson often finds mention among the worst U.S. presidents, primarily due to his mishandling of Reconstruction policies and resistance to radical Republican initiatives aimed at safeguarding the rights of newly emancipated African Americans. Johnson's legacy is viewed as contributing to the perpetuation of white supremacy, undermining Reconstruction, and unsettling the nation for generations. While acknowledging Johnson's shortcomings, some historians recognize the extraordinary nature of his narrative, a destitute individual ascending to great heights, experiencing a fall from grace, and persevering to regain a position of honor in the country. This highlights the intricate nuances of his historical legacy. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share it. Your support is greatly appreciated, and you can find details on how to support my channels through PayPal in the description box below.